Hi, Nikhil. It is so nice to be here. Um, I can't actually believe that I'm sitting right next to you here. Um, I have uh, been reading about you, I've been reading articles about you, watched videos about you, and I can't believe I'm finally having a conversation with you here in your beautiful home. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, uh, I think the first burning question, which everybody here, all of my audience, would want to know is, how much rent are you paying at this place? This place is unbelievable. My God, I, I must say to all your uh, viewers, Sharon is very different off camera than he is. <laughs> I'll figure out by the end of this interview if it's in a good way or a bad way. Okay. <laughs> but uh, not much relative to property costs in India. I think you're still able to manage rent at 2-3%. Mm -hmm. So it's not, not too bad. Okay. So we didn't get anything out of that. <laughs> Moving on to the next question. Uh, so I just wanted to understand, right? And it is a very juvenile question, but I think everybody wants to know, right? Because ever since uh, we start uh, understanding the importance of money, right, as an exchange of value and uh, something that you can use to buy a lot of stuff with, everybody wants to accumulate more and more. And so I just want to understand, how much money is too much money? Well, I don't think there is one particular answer to that question. Uh, money, success, all of these things are very relative in nature. Uh, if you have more money today than you had yesterday, you mm. feel better about better about life from a financial standpoint. Right. right. If you have reached a peak and then you kind of have lesser money, you don't feel right. as good. But it would I would be hard pressed to put a number on it. Mm -hmm. uh, one way of equating it is if you have enough money that affords you the freedom uh, to maybe not work for a certain amount of time. Right. Or pick who your colleagues are and choose to only work with people that you like. Uh, those are the real advantages which come with money. Right. Uh, I think the material stuff matters uh, for a certain amount of time and then it becomes kind of irrelevant. Right. And uh, these smaller things become more important to you. I think freedom is the biggest byproduct of having some amount of success. Right. And that I think I truly cherish. But I completely agree with you. I think uh, what we are talking about here is the concept of financial independence, right? It's, it's not exactly about having all the money in the world. It's about understanding that money is, um, is a reflection of your time, right? So if you have a certain amount of money, you can decide to do what to do with your time. Mm -hmm. And that is, nothing is more powerful than that. You can say, you have the power to say no to things. You have the power to decline a job which you don't really want to do. And there's nothing more uh, satisfying and more powerful than that. I think that's the true definition of money, which most people tend to forget. Yeah. Uh, and material stuff, like you said, it is the law of diminishing returns, right? You get, mm -hmm. you get something and you, get, you want something better than that. So it doesn't last uh, very long, Agreed. right? Wonderful. So moving on. Uh, so most people in India, at least in the metro city, so most of my audience are from the top five metro cities. And uh, people usually start off with, you know, 30, 40,000 per month. So I started with 27,833 per month living in Bangalore. And that was not enough money at all. And obviously at that age, most people don't really think about uh, investing, most of us. That's the first time we get money and we just want to enjoy it, right? It's not that we are reliant on anybody or it's not our parents' money, so we start enjoying it. By the time we reach 26, 27, that is when most people will make around 1 lakh per month. So that's around 12 lakhs per year. So what is your advice for someone who's making 12 lakhs per year? Because uh, the way someone would invest money making 12 lakhs per year versus someone making maybe you know, a few crores a year would be very different. Someone who's making 12 lakhs a year would first start to build a certain foundation which becomes a platform for him to become richer later on. So what would be your advice for someone making 12 lakhs a year? How would he, would he invest his money? Sure. So when I started working, right, it, it was a long time ago, about 17, 18 years ago now. I had a first job myself, right. like you were making 27,000, uh, notwithstanding inflation back then, I think my pay must have been 8,000 rupees a month or something like that. Uh, where you live uh, and how you live kind of defines how much money you need to earn. So first advice, if you can work from home and you're living in an expensive city like Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, uh, it might be prudent to go out and explore a tier two town, move back to uh, cities which are not as expensive uh, because you take away that you know proximity to the office that you work in and if you can work from somewhere else, uh, I think it's good both for you from your, uh, your kind of cost of living to the kind of lifestyle that you want to have perspective but also in terms of the environment you know like I think this urbanization and so many people living in cities mm. 
is not boding well for cities. Right. Uh, so that would be you know one tip. I, I think if you can work from home, uh, pick a city, pick a location, or pick a town which is more efficient, and your money goes the farthest there. Right. Uh, 12 lakh rupees, if you're a 27 year old guy, I'm guessing your appetite for risk is significant mm. and you're probably going to see an uptick in how much money you make, at least in the next decade. Uh, I'm fairly conservative, a little bit of a pessimist when it comes to investing. So I would say put something like, uh, you know, 20, 30 percent of your income in equity, mm. maybe put another 30 or 40 percent in asset classes which don't have too much risk. Mm. Uh, it could be gold, it could be fixed income, uh, it could be you know tax-free bonds, corporate debt, stuff like that. Uh, and the balance I think should be a mixture of maybe some real estate and uh, some kind of a liquid saving which you can have access to at any point of time. Mm. Uh, you know COVID happened and it showed us all uh, why arbitrary money, money which is not liquid and you can't access at any point of time is not as useful as money that is at hand. And I think right. everybody needs to account for those emergencies and keep a fund like that. Got it. So just to summarize, so you're saying for someone who is at his 24, 25 years old, in order to build a good foundation, first he should understand how to geographically, geographically arbitrage himself. So move to a cheaper location like a tier two, tier three city, maybe live with his parents. That's what I did, by the way, for one year when the pandemic happened and it saved a ton of money. You still live with your parents? And now I moved here uh, because I was tired of staying back home for the reason that you said, right? People are attracted to the metro cities because there are so many avenues to spend money, mm -hmm. right? But we need to sort of understand that um, uh, at, at our early stages, you can actually save a lot of money by uh, working from home and then move to a tier two city mm -hmm. until you have built a certain foundation. So that is one thing. Uh, the second thing that you said is really interesting to me. You said uh, the asset allocation that you talked about is really conservative. But most people, um, when they say, you know, when you're very young, 25, 26, they, most people recommend, you know, put as much as you can in equity, 70 to 80 percent, because equity, uh, you know, has its eventual cycles. It goes up and down. And when you're, you know, investing for long term, it's eventually going to go up when you finally need the money when you make a big purchase. I uh, was just curious to understand why uh, did you suggest such a conservative approach? Yeah, see, I think we are jaded in our outlook of how well equities have done mm -hmm. because our memories of the last 30 years when India has kind of opened up and we have only really witnessed the markets going up. Right. Uh, if you were to go back in time, you go back to the late 1920s or the early 1900s or you look at America just before the dot-com burst in the 2000s, right. There have been many times in life where there is a prolonged bear market, right? I don't mean like three years or five years, but you could have a bear market for 20 years, 30 years. Mm. We in India have not really witnessed uh, in the last 30, 40 years a bear market in right. either equities or in real estate. Mm. Hence, we have ended up in this position where because neither us, our parents or our grandparents have ever seen prices fall drastically, uh, we have started to believe in a way that real estate prices can never correct. Right. Uh, equities will always go up. Right. Uh, but I think history is a great teacher. But mm. uh, the idea is to not only look at the last 20 or 30 years, but go back in time, uh, go look at different centuries and see what has happened. Mm. And uh, the key in stock markets is not making a great return this year mm. or next year. As long as you're able to remain solvent mm. with little in some manner mitigated volatility for a long period of time. If you last an entire cycle of 20, 30 years in the equity market, the odds of you making money are significantly higher. Mm. So you would be better off having a more conservative portfolio, but keeping it for the longer run. But ha instead of, you know, having a portfolio with 80 percent equity, wherein if the markets fall 50 percent, you're so disappointed that you right. either have to sell everything or you do not come back to equity markets. Mm. Right. And I think one important point that you pointed out is uh, for the U.S. market has a significant database that they can look at. But Indian market is barely, you know, 30, 40 years. And all of them, most people quote, you know, over the past 30 years, Nifty has grown around 14.6 percent this year. And that's very attractive mm -hmm. to look at. And we can't go beyond that before that because we don't just have the data. So you're suggesting that uh, we are jaded by that. We are thinking that's going to happen uh, going forward as well. So it's important to have a conservative uh, outlook as well yeah. based on what has happened over centuries 
and other mature markets like the US. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, why you started True Beacon Hedge Fund? So you were very successful in your first venture. Everybody knows about Zero Da. It's a household name in India. You made, uh, you made investing so simple for millions of Indians. So why did you start uh, True Beacon Hedge Fund? Because most people, um, or what, what most people think that you know, before becoming successful for the first time, they'll be like, I'll do this. Once I become successful, I'm going to enjoy my life, and that will be it. Right? So what is that um, mindset? Uh, that people usually have. Once they become successful, then they go to the next thing and they make it big there as well. So what is your outlook towards that? See, success is a very arbitrary concept, right? Like, uh, when somebody sets out, sets out to achieve a certain thing or build a profitable company, I don't think anybody has that one given day where, you know, he's like satisfied and he's done what he set out to do. Uh, as humans, you know, innately we're all unhappy and we constantly need drive in life. Uh, very often, internally, it is very hard to inculcate that, but we have to find external sources to get that. Right. So each time you start a new company, you know, you have, you have another reason to wake up and do something that day. And I think right. that's very important. Uh, why we started True Beacon is because I was dealing with uh, private banks, wealth managers across mm -hmm. the world. Uh, they were very expensive. Mm. If I, as an investor, put money into a fund, the distributor would make 2%, the fund manager would charge 2%. Right. And all of these guys made money, even if I lost money. Mm. And I thought that was unfair. Right. Uh, so the point of starting True Beacon is to have a model where only if the client makes money does the fund house charge a fee. Mm. And the fee they charge is significantly lower than everybody else. Uh, it's only about 10% of the profit a client mm. makes. And if the client does not make profit, uh, you don't pay anything. Right. So I think that amount of efficiency is required even today. Uh, I'm talking about the hedge fund space, but if you were to look at uh, private banks, I think you know you transfer money uh, into your LRS fund, you pay 20 bips in forex charges. Mm. Uh, you buy a certain private equity, public equity product, you pay the guy selling you the fund as much as two, three, four, five percent. Right. I think there are many, many inefficiencies that one could uh, kind of like mitigate there. And True Beacon is one attempt to solve one problem in that sector. So I think most hedge funds around the world have this famous two and 20 model, right? right where two is the percentage charge on the entire AUM, regardless of whether the fund made money or not. So you guys have eliminated that. And the performance fees, which is usually 20 in the market, you've made that 10 percentage. Mm -hmm. So the fund makes money only when the investors make money. Right. Uh, so I just want to understand, in India, mm -hmm. um, hedge funds, uh, they come under AIF category 3. Yeah. And the minimum investment is 1 crore, Correct. right? But for, let, let's say, the, the, obviously the reason behind that is the government doesn't want you know, normal retail investors to invest in something that they don't understand easily. Right. And the general outlook is that with someone who has more than 1 crore to invest, he has the you know, investing maturity to invest in something like this. Um, but I personally feel that there are many retail investors as well in India, including me, right? right? I would also want to invest in these sort of uh, products, right. right? But I don't have one crore to just invest like that, right? So what is your Considering the number of followers you have and all the money right. you're making, you should be investing in products like that. Right, I should, but I still don't have one crore for the audience out there. Uh, I wish I had, I but... <laughs> <laughs> so there is no one crore, right. uh, just to uh, settle the uh, argument. Uh, but I would like to invest, right? So, but legally, I'm not allowed to. Uh, what What is your outlook on this? Would you think this is fair for retail investors who have the maturity to understand how this product works, but would still like to invest? Yeah, I mean, sure. See, I I think uh, the the minimum benchmark of how much money one should invest. Mm. Uh, is less a barrier, like PMS has 50 lakhs, right. mutual fund has a much smaller number. Right. Uh, I don't think that is the problem. The bigger problem for the industry is taxation. Mm. Uh, if you were to tax three different products in three different ways, but they essentially do the same thing. Mm. I'm talking about a PMS, a mutual fund and a AIF. Right. These are broadly three ways in which one can manage their money uh, mm. through a fund manager in India, right. focused on the public equity space. Uh, taxation in A is X, in B is Y, and in C is Z. And I think uh, the ambiguity that arises from that is not helping people. People mm. uh, have to put in a lot of work to compute taxes, make sure they're compliant and stuff like that. Uh, 
uh, I think some work needs to be done there from the regulator, the government side. Mm. But in terms of the minimum, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, uh, see, the thing with uh, having a lower minimum for somebody like us is let's assume you're a client who has one crore rupees. Mm. Let's say you invest in True Beacon. If we make 10% return for you, which in our minds is a, is a good return, mm. a year, uh, you make 10 lakh rupees, you pay the fund house 10% uh, of that profit, which is 1 lakh rupees. Uh, if you break that down, is about 8,000 rupees a month. Right. Uh, for the amount of work that goes towards managing your 1 crore, that 8,000 is very little. Mm. Uh, you know, right. we have like really high-end teams. We right. have people from like Harvard and Stanford and PhD, then all these guys working on managing your money. So even at that one crore, at our fee model, it doesn't make sense. Got it. You need to, you know, come in with 10 crores, 15 crores for us to be able to justify the amount of work that goes into managing your money. Got it. Yeah. So we could charge a lot more. Mm. Instead of 10%, we could be 2 and 20 and then it would make sense, right? Right. Uh, but the way we are approaching it is, you know, we'll charge so little but we have to scale for the model to work. Got it. Got it. So the issue is not more about the minimum investment for retail investors, but it should make sense for the fund as well uh, from, a, uh, from an operational point of view Correct. to sustain. So, uh, Nikhil, uh, do you invest in cryptocurrencies? No, I don't. And what is your outlook on that? Why do you, why do you not uh, want to invest in cryptocurrencies? Because that has been the talk of the town last year. Yeah. Why do you think uh, that? Why do you not want to invest in cryptocurrencies or NFTs? So, so from a personal perspective, uh, we, we work in a very regulated world, right? We are in stockbroking, asset management, lending. Uh, we will never, we can never be in the position where we do something that is not 100% regulated. Uh, right now in India, regulation around cryptocurrencies is in the grey. Mm. Uh, one does not know what is allowed, what is not allowed. Mm. Uh, they've come out with, you know, whatever taxation and TDS and all of that. But on a pragmatic level, how does that really work? I don't think is extremely clear yet. Right. Uh, so just because of regulation, one would not do it, uh, at least somebody in uh, my position. Hmm. But outside of that, uh, I, I feel like the crypto world has moved from, you know, calling it a currency, which they did a few years ago, right. to now calling it an asset class of its own. Uh, you know, I've been following the crypto story a little bit. I, I watch how it is becoming uh, more efficient to kind of like transact in cryptos. Mm. The whole moving from uh, proof of work to proof of stake to proof right. of history. I think it will get to a point where it is so efficient that for every crypto transaction, the, the kind of like uh, cost per ta transaction mm. in terms of energy will go down significantly. I think that will happen. Mm. Uh, but, you know, if you go back in time and try to figure out what is a currency, right? Uh, a currency is, uh, outside of being a median for exchange, it has an intrinsic value, which back in the day was gold. You know, we had Bretton Woods, we had the gold standard, we, we weaned off all of that. I'm talking about the fiat time. Mm. Is, is, is a, the value of the currency is a norm which is accepted by the majority of the ecosystem, right? Think of it as religion. Mm. If everybody on the planet were Christians today, for example, uh, there would be no contesting uh, the credibility of a certain, uh, certain religious, whatever, like mm. say currency, coin or whatever. Uh, so Bitcoin cryptocurrencies as a religion have done very well in the last decade or so. My two big problems with it is, you know, A, there is no underlying. Uh, B, today they are too uh, energy inefficient in the manner in which they operate. Right. And three, the world is so divided on them where half the countries kind of will disallow it, the other half will allow it. Uh, four, the, the so many different types of cryptos which right. are out there. And you know, how is one to say that A will be prevalent tomorrow versus the thousand others which are uh, there in the ecosystem? Right. Uh, but beyond all that, I think uh, the reduced regulation that uh, cryptocurrencies have brought with them have, uh, for, for one reason or another, uh, 
created an ecosystem where a vast majority of crypto transactions happening in the world today are not happening for uh, very legi legitimate reasons, mm. the few transactions that are happening. Right. That's true. Uh, and do I want to kind of be a part of that market and you know, tomorrow what happens if, uh, you know, say in America, some guy without any KYC or without, ha without having identification, you know, somebody who's on the peer-to-peer -peer network buys an AK-47 and kills 100 people using cryptocurrencies mm. or, you know, something on a much larger scale where somebody buys a larger weapon. Uh, I always wonder what happens beyond that. Mm. Uh, and I don't have answers to so many of these questions and hence I don't. Right. Uh, my explanation for crypto would be different. NFTs, on the other hand, I think there is a use case for it. Mm. Uh, but is the market... Uh, extremely inflated today probably I think yeah. the metaverse has a great use case mm. uh, like this might be a very counterintuitive way of thinking about it but the whole carbon problem in the planet right like metaverse could be one of the answers for it mm. if instead of you driving from wherever and coming here uh, you know you could plug into a device and there's like uh, it, it feels so real tomorrow that it right. feels like we are sitting next to each other you don't drive from your home to here right like that's right uh, I think it has many answers there, but uh, I've been an investor in, you know, Facebook for a long time, Meta now, and, you know, I thought they were brilliant in when they bought, you know, Instagram and WhatsApp and Oculus uh, in respect to the metaverse. But uh, between those two companies and that much money that they put behind it, between Microsoft and Facebook, which are probably leading the metaverse race, mm. uh, I don't think they've been able to crack it yet. Right. So I don't think it is five years down the line, maybe it is 10 years down the line, but probably definitely a use case for it. Got it. Sorry for the long winded right. answer for <laughs> that question. No, that is really, really enlightening. <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, touch on one last thing in the crypto space, uh, in DeFi, right? Because that is sort of, you know, I, I see a use case in that, wherein, you know, when I want to lend some someone money, I don't have to rely on a, an, a central authority, like a bank, yeah. to lend my money to someone, because he will take its commission, and he is, anyways, sort of like a middleman, and ensures that my money is safe and going to the right kind of people. Whereas DeFi is sort of removing that middleman, I can directly lend it to someone, and then I get all the returns, right? I mean, a small person, percentage goes into the platform to sustain it, right. but I get to keep the majority of the returns. Right. And that is a re really a booming space right now. There are several startups which are coming in India right. as well, sort of tapping on this opportunity and helping people invest in this space. Right. So what do you think about DeFi? It definitely has a use case. But see, I can also tell you that, you know, instead of doing all of that using... Uh, uh, something, a currency on the blockchain, mm. you can use a normal currency, remove the regulator and just do peer-to-peer -peer lending, right? Yeah, like if you want to borrow right. money, you borrow from me. And right. if I want to like borrow from someone, mm. I borrow from you. Right. That can happen in any situation. It does not necessarily need the blockchain in a way. Mm. Uh, you know, there are a few examples, right? I can't remember the company. There was this T5 bank, which was scaling quite well up until a few months ago. I can't, re mm. I can't recollect what the name in is. India? Not in India, globally. Okay. But again, they have their own issues. Um, they were using, I, I don't want to say something I'm not entirely sure about, but uh, I think whenever, at the end of the day, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network where A is lending to B, B is lending to A, mm. without a regulator in between. Right. Uh, in platforms like that, I think the risks which exist with using the dollar or the euro or the rupee or any global currency, to a large extent, many of these risks also exist there. Mm. Here you have the added advantage of knowing who your client is, uh, mm. which geography he belongs to, having a, having a you know, court and a, and a rule of law in a way in which if one kind of like uh, uh, does something incorrectly, there is something that you can go back on. Right. But is there a use case for you know, having a DeFi you know, bank or a lending platform? Definitely in the future, yeah. But uh, do you absolutely need for cryptocurrencies to make that work? Maybe not. Mm. Yeah. Why not use like a government regulated currency for stuff like that? Right. Like, right. I think what that's what's going to happen yeah. as well in this country yeah. at least. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so w w what are some of the things that you're doing apart from what you're already known for? You, right. Everybody knows you for Zeroda and they already know, everybody knows you for True Beacon as well. Right. So what are some of the side projects that you're doing, yeah. which not many people know about? Right? It has to be yeah. something new and never told to anybody. 
something I've not told anybody. Anybody as in not on public at least. <laughs> okay. I mean, that is hard. Our uh, PR person is here and she tells people before it actually happens <laughs> more often than not. But uh, something new. So your space, like we were discussing right. earlier. Right. Uh, I think the influencer marketing platform is going to be huge. Right. Not just in India, but across the world. Uh, that 1,200, 300 crores spent on influencer marketing in India I think will grow to be many billion dollars in a few years. Wow. Uh, people will consume content and reach brands through uh, social media, maybe a bit more than they do through TVs and newspapers. Mm. So that's an interesting platform. Uh, we have that uh, investment in Cofluence, but mm. nothing I'm personally involved with. It's not right. like uh, I'm part of the day-to-day -day working of any of the companies which are doing anything interesting there. Uh, on the other side, we have a new charity called YIPP. Mm. It's called Young India Philanthropy Pledge. Okay. Uh, so the idea is here we are focusing on Bangalore mm. and there have been many entrepreneurs who have made it big in Bangalore. Right. Uh, often because of uh, the circumstances that they grew up in, like, you know, uh, a lot of them are very hardworking and intelligent and all of that. But they've also done exceedingly well because they had this environment in which they could thrive, right? That's right. They were in the right place at the right time. Uh, a lot of them believe in giving back to society. So we've gotten a good group of these people together, uh, you know, primarily unicorn founders from Bangalore. Mm. And uh, we work on different projects from time to time. Right now we are working on a project which is... Uh, uh, trying to improve the standard of 200 government high schools in Karnataka. Mm. So everything from, you know, uh, smart classrooms, training the teachers, uh, building toilets in the school. Uh, there is enough research to show that better infra has a direct correlation with marks, with attendance and uh, uh, the idea is to do something there. So it's called YIPP, that's an interesting project. Uh, we started this company called Gruhas. Uh, okay. I have a friend called Abhijit in Hyderabad and uh, we've started this maybe a uh, year ago. And um, we're doing a lot of prop tech investments. Uh, uh, prop tech in the sense of, you know, it could be fractionalizing commercial real estate or building better uh, ESG compliant building materials, mm -hmm. solutions. That's an interesting project. Uh, at uh, Zeroda, we have the Rain Matter Climate Fund, mm, right. where we do a lot of, uh, with uh, Samir and uh, Rishabh and Dinesh and uh, Kailash, these guys do a lot of interesting uh, investments. Um, so it's a very well known fact that um, what you're able to achieve in life and how much success you get in your life is very much dependent on the kind of people you surround yourself with. Um, take my case for example. So when I started creating content, I was doing it by myself. And then I met my brand manager, Ayush Shukla. And yeah. right, so he is, that's him, that's him right there. So I had around uh, 11, 12,000 followers, and then I met him, and boom, right? Yeah. He gets me in touch with the right kind of people. I surround myself with the right kind of people, and I get to learn a lot from them, and that sort of defines how I want to, you know, uh, what are the kind of things that I want to do in life, and what are the uh, things I want to give my attention to. Who are those people for you? I, I think I should tell your audience that uh, when this started, this uh, meeting started, you first asked him if you're looking good. Right. <laughs> then you told me you guys are single. <laughs> then right. you said you live together. <laughs> right. And now you're praising him on the interview. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, what was your question again? <laughs> My question was... Who are those five people that you surround yeah. yourself with? Yeah. And how is that important all of, for you? All of them in my case are married and have kids. Let me start by okay. prefacing okay. it like that. <laughs> but <laughs> it would be, uh, it would be uh, Nitin, uh, my brother, obviously, right. to begin with. Right. Then there's Kailash, there's Richard, uh, there are... Uh, Can you tell us who they are, like what do they do? Yeah, own. so Nitin's brother, uh, yeah. partner in everything, and right. we've been together, you know, from childhood. So we right. do all our work-related stuff together. Uh, Kailash is our CTO who is like the brain of the operations, mm. and uh, he's everybody's moral compass. He makes sure uh, we are doing things which are not 
just good for us, but good for the environment, the ecosystem, right. the world at large. Hmm. Richard is the white guy that Kudrat was talking about earlier. He's a, a British national who was in the army for uh, a long time, a fighter helicopter pilot. Mm. He moved to become the CEO of uh, True Beacon. Uh, so again, interesting chap. But then there is uh, uh, there is Karthik and Hanan and Venu. Uh, so a lot of the people we work with, colleagues of ours, mm are not people who have been recruited formally or stuff like that. These are uh, friends, family first and then colleagues. Mm. Uh, like, uh, for example, Venu is my neighbor from when I used to be like 12 years old and play cricket and, okay. you know, wow. he's stuck to us. And mm. uh, Karthik is somebody I used to maybe have a drink with long back and he's mm. with us. And uh, it's a very um, uh, cohesive team. It's not it's not a corporate model where you, you know, kind of like figure out what the role is and figure out who fits that role. But it's more uh, people you've grown up with, people you've grown together with, uh, who have been kind enough to stick with us through the time. And uh, uh, even if, you know, businesses exist or not, I think these friendships will exist through time. Mm. That's yeah. an interesting point because some people say, you know, you shouldn't start something with your close family members or close friends because if it doesn't work out, then it has the potential to damage those relationships as well. But you sort of um, approached it in a different way and you've actually made it a strength for you and it's working out really well for you as well. Right. I hope you do the same <laughs> as well. No, in our, case, in our case, it started off as business. Right. It was a very, very uh, cocky guy. So, okay, you, you started off as, as business and what are you guys now? Now we are really good. <laughs> so we first started off talking. Right. <laughs> and then you went on a date. No, we just on, we were on phone. I'm like, who is this like, 22 year old guy right. who's wearing 21, this? Right. 21, 21. Okay. So who wears the pants in this relationship? I know he's a little bit older, but <laughs> I mean friendship, like. You guys are colleagues and friends yeah. too, right? Like, who is it? Yeah, we're like equals, I guess. Uh -huh. Equal. Nice. I would agree. Yeah. I can see the love. <laughs> okay, I think we're done here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, so an important aspect about bringing, building any company. So right now, even um, when I handle, when I do content creation, it has become important for me also to you know hire people, and it's sort of become like a small uh, startup. Uh, and I'm slowly starting to realize you know the importance of hiring the right kind of people. So it'd be interesting to understand from you, uh, what do you look for when hiring the right kind of people? Because gone are the days where people just look at pedigree, and I know looking at pedigree was uh, something which people look at uh, to make the uh, filtering process simpler. Um, but how do you bypass that and look beyond that and hire the right kind of people, regardless of whether they have a good pedigree or not? Because there might be some good gems in there, with the, uh, even, even among people who don't have, uh, you know, solid companies to back them up. Just to be like honest about it, uh, in a candid manner, I don't think I am good at hiring people. Mm. I, I don't even have anybody who reports to me. Mm. Uh, I think what all of this, you know, you can call it success, but being in the right place at the right time for so long right. has afforded me is the privilege to uh, do what I like mm. and not really be responsible for, you know, team's performance or mm. different guys are doing their job in the right way. So I spend most of my time doing research, investing, uh, uh, everything market related, any market, any asset class, because that I, I enjoy. And I foresee myself doing that for uh, a long, long time. But when it comes to hiring people, hire people who you can be friends with. Mm. You right. know, uh, I think it becomes very important, especially if you're building something new. Mm. You will spend so much time with these people, right? Uh, right? I think you have to hire people who you enjoy spending time with and you can mm. trust in a way. Right. I think that's important. Also, one more thing that I've recently discovered is uh, show them what uh, what in the short term what it's going to look like working for you. So that sort of is always at the back of their head, right? Um, if I work well over here, 
this is the kind of uh, uh, platform that we can reach. So this is the kind of uh, recognition that we can reach. So that sort of becomes a driving motivation for people to stick and for loyalty to increase. Because in today's world, it is so easy for people to just you know move to the other company. Now, because obviously money is one of the number one things which people look at when right. taking a job. Right. So the next question is a little bit uh, uh, more serious. Mm -hmm. um, so this is about uh, what gives you sleepless nights. And I'll, I'll go first. So. Mine is, you know, this, oh no. <laughs> I think this guy's going to make every question like that. I'm just going to carefully. <laughs> right. So, uh, coming back. Yeah, coming back. So, I'll tell you what gives me sleepless nights. Um, so the content creation economy, especially in the education space, the finance education space, it has blown up in this last year. Uh, now nobody knows where it's going, how big it's going to get, and how uh, relevance is a very important thing in this industry, right? As most of the content creators, they don't know how long is their uh, lifespan. Like cr uh, cricketers have around 10, 15 years to do it. People in the corporate job can work as long as 60 years old. Uh, but content creators don't really know, right? Four to five years is what most people fear it's going to be like. So that is something that worries me. How do I remain relevant for the longest period of time? And another thing is, you know, once you do something big, once you do something disruptive, if it works, people tend to copy that, right? So it's the constant pressure to keep innovating and do something different. And I'm sure companies also face this, right? When, some, somebody, when a company does something right, other competition is going to kind of copy that and replicate that. Uh, so this is what gives me sleepless nights. What is it for you? What is it for you? Well, I think, uh, A, for your problem, right? I think uh, there is so much loyalty as associated with creators of today. I think... Since you're the very first breed of content creators, really, who have some amount of scale in India, right. I think your audience will grow with you. And uh, I, I don't think it's something you should worry about. I think you're in a space which is, you know, blowing up and right. uh, you'll probably have 10 times more followers, even if you make less relevant content mm. 10 years from now than you do today. Uh, for me, sleepless nights, uh, uh, Many, many things. Uh, I think, you know, the existential question of why you're doing what you're doing. Right. Uh, also, you know, I'm... I, How I do live you in, answer that? Why you're doing what you're doing? You there's, no, there's no answer. No I mean, answer. you know, you question anything for long enough, it will appear meaningless, right? Mm -hmm. It could be a profession, it could be a relationship, mm -hmm. it could be anything you do in life. Uh, I think... Uh, I, I like psychology a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, that's probably my hobby, like psychology and history. Mm -hmm. I don't read books and finance anymore. These are mm -hmm. two things I like. Uh, if you think about anything in your life for long enough, it will appear meaningless. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, do you want to remain unhappy, uh, questioning constantly what is the purpose of life? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to deceive yourself into thinking whatever you're doing has meaning mm -hmm. and live happier in that manner? So I, I'm in the latter right now, so I'm kind of like telling myself that whatever stupid thing I might be doing in life has meaning and it's mm. uh, doing something for people, it's making uh, whatever a better place. Uh, do I actually believe in it? No. But can right. I superficially deceive myself? Yeah. Right. Like if you look at somebody like, uh, there's this philosopher called Kamu, uh, he says the biggest philosophical question, the problem in life, is suicide like you're born and you can think you have to ask yourself why you're living and if you don't know why should you die okay. uh, i think many things in nature that way but humans uh, do not work that way mm. uh, so that is it like you know deceive myself by thinking you know like i was telling you about why pp earlier mm. or i can deceive myself thinking we've started this new company uh, and growing that company is my meaning in life right uh, is it true? No. But uh, am I doing a okay enough job thinking that I should think that is, th that is true? Yeah. Right. So that yeah. is the deceiving part. Yeah. And I think that's important as well. Because when, when we have a lot of free time, especially when I was in my schooling years, yeah. when, when I finished my 10th grade, I just have a lot of freedom. I'm just thinking about what life is. And you can go into that spiral, right? Yeah. Why am I even living? What is happening? What is all of this? But most of the periods of time, we're always busy doing something or the other. So we don't get to question these sort of things. But when we have a lot of free time, we do sort of uh, kind of question ourselves whether, whether what we're doing has any meaning to it. Yeah. And, and that inevitably happens. 
right or wrong in life, uh, we are often conditioned to think that things went well hmm. because of what we did. Right. Uh, things did not work out because of what we did. Like, hmm. say your career did not work out because you didn't study enough, or right. you didn't get good marks, or you didn't work hard enough at your job, and you didn't right. earn enough. Uh, but when you step back and look at the broader picture, uh, everything is so random in life. Hmm. Like, right. The reason me and you are sitting here and having this conversation is we were born to families, I'm not saying wealthy families, mm. but we were born to whatever families which could afford to give you a vaccine, right. send you to school, right. uh, you know, whatever education you've had. Uh, that opportunity is not afforded to 90% of, uh, you know, mm. the country right. we live in. That's correct. The, the opportunities that we've had. So whatever we have in life, however we have got it, is uh, in many ways less a factor of the great things we have done, mm. but more a factor of where we have been at what point of time. And mm. I think you should acknowledge that at some level and right. realize that you have very little control over the outcomes of tomorrow. Mm. Think whatever you're doing is important today. Mm. And as long as you believe it, you're happier off for having believed it. Right. And I think that's beautiful. I think I'm going to continue doing that now. A lot of our audience right. are very young, you know, 18 to 24 years old. Right. And they're watching this content. Uh, to I'm not that old. I know, I know. <laughs> but 10 years away from you guys. Right. Uh, but around 45 to 50% of my audience is in the 18 to 24 years old. And all of us want to know what's the next big thing. Right. So I wanted to understand from you, if you were that young, right. let's say 22 years old today, and I know trading is your passion. Let's say you haven't discovered trading yet. You don't know what that is, mm. right? So if that were the case, what would you be doing right now? If wealth is your only motive, what would you be doing right now in today's world as a 22-year-old kid? Content creation, what you guys are Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I okay. think, I think right. uh, marketing is a constant in business, right? right. It's existed through time. Right. So there have been different means of marketing. Okay. Whenever you're able to catch an industry when it's transitioning from A to B, right. uh, you often end up catching the inflection point if you're doing something okay. Hmm. And I think you guys are at that point. I think right. like, uh, content creators, uh, not just for entertainment, not just for branding, not just for news consumption, uh, in many ways you guys will become so relevant tomorrow. Like, you know, uh, I wouldn't be hard pressed to imagine if. Uh, somebody becomes a really, really big content creator in, in the thought leadership space, mm. an election could be influenced by what he thinks and who he thinks people should vote for. Mm. Uh, having that reach to people mm. will become incre increasingly relevant with time because back in the day, you know, somebody in Mumbai could probably access a million people right. in his domain. Mm. But with the internet and social media, now somebody, that same person can reach the entire country. If right if his thought leadership is valid in a way and people resonate with that. Right. So I think you guys are in the right place at the right time. And onus is totally on you guys to, you know, mm. take it forward and kill it with it. So I actually ran a tweet as well on my Twitter. I asked people, you know, what do you think is the easiest way to make money? Mm. And surprise, surprise, most people said content creators. Uh, and uh, that's interesting to me because um, I was recently watching this uh, uh, this interview uh, on uh, Nas Daily right. and he says it is impossible to be happy as a content creator because we as human beings are not wired mm -hmm. to uh, be hated by millions of people right. or to be liked by tens of millions of people, right? right? We can only have maybe 150 connections in our lifetime mm -hmm. but being a content creator that that mm -hmm. sort of connection algorithm it goes for a toss, right? right? You're suddenly bombarded with thousands and thousands of messages where people are saying, you know, you're doing amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. And then there are again, thousands and thousands of people who are doubting you and saying, you know, what you're doing is shit. Mm -hmm. Right. And that sort of, you know, messes with your head. And the, what he says is that, you know, you can never be happy as a content creator. Right. right? Um, do you think that's true? Well, again, if you go back in time, right, like you go back to the time of racism, mm -hmm. you go back uh, I mean, this might not be the best example. I don't mean this in a contradictory manner in any form. Mm. Uh, but when the whole white and black divide existed in America, for example, right? Mm. When they bought African slaves to America. Uh, things like entertainment, things like, you know, performing arts, all of this was reserved for the lower strata of society. 
Mm. And one entertainer would entertain maybe like twenty people, or thirty people, or fifty people. Mm. As as population grew, as as the stage on which these people were performing got bigger, mm. I think these people became more influential and more popular. Right. To the extent that today the entertainers have become the biggest influencers. And right. In in a certain euphemized manner, the most mm. powerful people. Right. Uh, I think that trend is set to continue. Mm. Uh, I think the realm of influence will only grow with time as connectivity increases globally. Mm. Right. Uh, and if you're able to influence, I don't know how many people follow you today, but let's say it's a million. Mm. Uh, that is corroboration. You know, that's your random testing size. Mm. If you are certain that one million people are loving what you're putting out right now. I think in the future you should not be hard hard pressed to think that there will be hundred times more people mm. who will follow you and you will become so much bigger by virtue. Got it. All right, Nikhil. I think um, that is all the questions I had. Is there anything else that you would like to add um, apart from what we have just discussed? No, nothing really. I think uh, kudos to you guys being as young as you are, right? Uh, and so enterprising. I think. Uh, Twenty years ago, if I met a twenty-six year old and a twenty-two year old, and uh, uh, you told me all that you guys are doing already, right. it would be unbelievable. So, I think great job, guys, and uh, keep up the good work. Yeah. And I hope I see you guys scale uh, exponentially. Thank you so much, Nikhil. That was it. Was wonderful interacting with you. Yeah.